I haven't even done anything. So, <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to kind of walk you guys through uh, through the whole day of the uh, crash, you know, before, during, after, and uh, just kind of let you know how uh, things that have helped me to kind of keep pushing forward and staying positive and um, basically being healthy physically and mentally. So, uh, so uh, feel free to ask questions and, uh, you know, uh, if I get, sometimes I get a little misty, so just don't judge, yeah, so. All right, so uh, the December 15th, uh, 2015, uh, it was a Tuesday. So, uh, you know, Taco Tuesday for most of us. Um, start off like any other shift, you know, like any other shift. Come in, you do your checkoffs, you know, very, very, uh, you know, routine. Um, so that day, uh, the crew on duty was uh, our pilot, David Schneider, and uh, the flight nurse was Chad Ferrari, who was also the uh, base manager, uh, and then uh, myself. So, uh, you know, Schneider had a, you know, long, long history of flying helicopters and, Ch you know, Chad was in the Marines too, so we'd always, you know, uh, give Schneider a hard time because he was in the Army, so. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we had a good time. We flew, we'd flown together for the last six months, you know, just, just out there doing work. Picture Schneider. He's cool, cool dude, cool dude. And then uh, Chad and I, um, right before we lifted for a flight, uh, the orange sunglasses, I always share these little tidbits, but those orange sunglasses were the uh, sunglasses he wore when he figured out his real good sunglasses, so he wore them all the time. <laughs> I was like, you forgot your sunglasses again, dude. So, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. Our crew change was a 6.30, you know, oh, excuse me. Like I said, uh, no big deal. Their changeover, you know, just like anyone, you know, you, you, you check off your engine, you check off your ambo, same thing with the helicopter. You know, uh, no big deal. We spent the most of the morning just doing online training, you know, just joking around, nothing, nothing crazy. Uh, our flight came in uh, around lunchtime, if I remember. Um, it was a, a piece of cake flight, um, you know, for us. You know, we just jump over the mountains. So uh, Cobra Valley, which is just um, inside the uh, town of Globe, and it was legit. You know, guy having a big STEMI, you know, you know, had him on a trital drip and you know, pads on and everything. Um, but he did really well, he did really well. Um, so like the flight from there to Baywood was, was totally uneventful. So yeah, so basically what everything I just said. So we, uh, after we cleared Baywood, we uh, repositioned back over to Williams to get fuel, you know, like we've done, we do a thousand times. Um, the aircraft had just come back from a big overhaul, so, um, about five days before. So, uh, you know, everything was running great. You know, the, I remember the pilots were joking, if, you know, flight's like a Corvette, you know, it's great. So, uh, yeah, we got a fuel, did our walk around. It's like all our routine safety stuff. Uh, nothing was crazy, you know, nothing was crazy at all. Uh, some, uh, some fun facts, I, uh, when we got uh, the, the call, I ran and grabbed our night vision goggles because it's not uncommon to get back-to-backs. Um, so I was like, well, I'll throw them in the tail. And I had uh, gotten halfway out the door and uh, forgot my cell phone. I was like, eh, I better go back and grab it. So I grabbed that, you know, stuck into my flight suit. And uh, little did I know that would, that would play a major part of uh, me being rescued. So yeah, piece of cake, going back to base. 25 minutes, three souls on board. No problems. So as you all know, the superstitions, uh, I try to keep a picture of the superstitions and sometimes I have to go, I go out of state and uh, give this presentation. And for those of you that have actually been out there, like you, you uh, kind of forget how unforgiving the land can be out there. So um, the day before the 15th, so on the 14th, there was a big winter storm. Like the one we had, a uh, you know, six or seven weeks ago where there was a lot of snow on the ground. So the superstitions probably had, I don't know, three, three inches of snow on them. Um, you know, it was beautiful. You know, it was clear. It was cold. You know, weather wasn't a factor. Um, like really nothing out of the ordinary. So there's our aircraft. So 74317, the tail. 
Uh, I, that, I'm not sure who that is on the left there. It's not me. But uh, that's our aircraft as it looked the day before. So, um, you know, the things, the things I recall, we lifted from, from Williams, heading eastbound. We, uh, we didn't, Chad's house was actually along our flight path. So we actually did a orbit over his house so he could wave to his daughter, uh, you know, kind of, which, which was sad. So then we, we did, that was the only thing out of the ordinary, so aside from crashing. Um, but I don't recall any uh, vibrations, you know, smells. You know, like I told the NTSB and the FAA, I was like, there was nothing distracting, nothing like a warning sign, like, you know, did you, did you hear that? Nothing like that at all. So, um, I was charting on our laptop, like in the, in the ship, we can chart on our laptop. Um, so I was kind of eyes down. Um, we were talking, you know, Chad and I were talking about the patient, blah, blah, blah. And you know, how, you know, firemen back me up. You know, you put, you put three guys in a little space and you're gonna, you're gonna joke around with each other. And so we were, you know, joking around and stuff. But uh, just, just regular conversation. Um, you know, when, when this is when things start going bad. So, you know, as we're, as we're flying, uh, we had kind of gone into just a, like a subtle dive. Nothing you would pick your head up over. Everyone who's flew, you know, you feel like it was about where we'd start descending to go back to base. But the, that descending started to go more into a dive. And then, um, like I didn't even realize it, but then our pilot, uh, you know, Schneider just yells, oh shit. And, uh, you know, whenever a pilot says that, you look up. You know, it's, it's generally, you're gonna look up, so. So, uh, so I just remember looking up, and you could just you could see the terrain coming. You know, the snow, the rocks, the brush, the trees. Um, and you know, first I had enough. You know, I, you know, <gasps> I had enough time to look up and grab you know grab my harness. And uh, you know, you the, those split seconds of like, is this really happening? Like, you know, are we going to pull out? You know, you're just waiting for that that pull out. So we um, started to dive. And then we banked hard right, probably the hardest bank I've ever done. Um, you know, hard right, trying to go for altitude. And uh, like I remember, you know, Schneider kind of fighting the stick. So, uh, but there, there was nothing. But by this time, it was you know, we're, we're going to hit. So, it's pretty, it's pretty terrifying. You know, to, to be crashing in an aircraft is something that no one should really experience, and few do and survive. So. Um, like I remember the brush coming and the snow and so close that, you know, you could just reach out and touch it, you know, just, you know, unbelievable. So um, when we hit, you know, the NTSB said we were doing about 120 knots. So it's about 130 miles per hour ground speed. So, you know, just, just unbelievable impact. You know, you know, I was telling the NTSB, you know, you know, it's not, it's not like, we hit the mountain. It was like the mountain hit us. You know, it was just this unbelievable impact. You know, just astonishingly violent. So uh, this was our what it looked like. So you know, as we hit, I remember the first thing. You know, the just the huge impact. You know, when we impacted, you could see the the deck of the aircraft just kind of buckled. I think that's where I broke both my legs. Was right there. Just that sudden deceleration. So, uh, you know, and I remember the windscreen, you know, our windshield just, it blew right in. You know, I can still see it, it just blew in and flew right at me, it hit me right in the face. Um, yeah. So I, I tell flight crews to keep your, your shields down, chin straps and shields down. Um, and then we had started to roll. So it's, I would say we rolled probably two or three times, but I remember um, I tell people, you know, if you go to San Diego, you go, you go surfing, and you know, you wipe out, and uh, you start that tumble in the wave where you lose all sense of up, down, left, right, and then you know, all of a sudden, you know, it stops. Um, that's kind of how you felt. Like all of a sudden, it stopped, and then you can get your bearings and you know, get back up. Um, but I remember during the roll, <laughs> to be honest with you, I remember thinking in my head. As we were rolling, like uh, just very calmly, I remember thinking, "Well, this is how I die. You know, the mystery's over. Like this is it." You know, which is pretty pretty surreal. So uh, I remember feeling all the brush hit my face. You know, 
And the whole time we were rolling, I was just waiting for a snap or a, you know, a stab or getting crushed or something. Um, and then when we did finally stop rolling, we landed on the pilot side. So the pilot side is down. That's my side up. The medic sits on the left, the nurse sits on the right. And uh, I was actually uh, ejected out like feet first, kind of like you see those paratrooper movies in World War II, you know, guys jumping out feet first. So I remember seeing my boots like flying out and then uh, slamming down on, on the top of the hull. That's where I think I, I broke my scapula, I think. So, um, you know, you think in an aviation crash, you know, in the movies we see, you know, all, you think it's all this noise and chaos and it was nothing like that. It was when we stopped rolling and, you know, I, I finally uh, kind of got my wits and was looking around, it was dead silent. You're in the middle of the mountains, you're in no man's land, you know, dead silent. Uh, you know, this time it was, the sun was setting, it was about 5, 5, 15, 520, something like that when we crashed. Um, you know, in the, in the wintertime, you know, it gets dark pretty quick. It, get, it gets cold even quicker. So, um, here's some kind of different views. You guys can see the snow on the ground. This is in the morning, the next morning. So it, it had melted a bit, but I remember it being like enough where you can leave like a deep footprint in the snow. So, um, you know, after that, you know, I remember starting to shout for Chad and for Schneider. Um, you know, I could hear Schneider, you know, just taking those agonal breaths. We all heard as, you know, medical providers. Um, maybe five or six breaths and then, you know, no response, no anything, you know, and that's hard. That's one of the things I struggle with is hearing that and, you know, it's just one of those bad memories you wish you could delete. Um, he, uh, I, I don't even know what his exact injuries were, but no, he, uh, he was impaled through the, his eye by a tree branch, and you know it was pretty. It was pretty hard to think about. So I never saw him, but uh, you know it's hard to think. You know which is worse, seeing him or imagining what you think you see. So, um, but so uh, this time, you know, the first thing I'm thinking about is the aircraft's going to catch on fire. I got to get out of here. Because that's what, that's what helicopters do, they catch on fire. So um, I don't even feel my legs yet. So I managed to get out of my harness and slide down off the, uh, the top of the aircraft. You can see where the, uh, the skid is right there, kind of just come the left part of the skid I just tried to use to get down. Um, I broke in my right ankle too, so that was, that was an, an interesting fall. So, so I remember when I hit the snow, you know, I felt there was something kind of funny with my legs, but I really hadn't felt anything yet. Um, and that's where I saw Chad, because, I, I, you know, he's sitting maybe just, I don't know, probably from me to the end of the stairs there, you know, just a few feet away, you know, and I was like, dude, you know, hey, you know, I'll be right there, you know, because when I was shouting for him, I remember that's when I tried to stand up, and that's when I felt both my femurs just shifting, you know, you felt that pop, pop, pop. You know, and I remember, I remember, you know, catches your breath, you know, like, oh my God. You know, I remember, I remember telling Chad, it's like, dude, I'm, I'm hurt, like, I'm hurt bad. You know, like, I'll be right there. Um, so I kind of just started to low crawl, you know, as a Marine, you know, we, we do a lot of low crawling in the Marine Corps. So, uh, you know, kind of like when you guys are on your elbows, using your elbows to move. So when I started moving, then I could feel my ribs moving. It was like, oh, you know, so it was, it hurt, <laughs> and then my scapula was moving. So, uh, but when I did get to him, um, he was he was on his back with his feet towards me. Both of our we lost both our helmets in the impact, um, and his right arm was underneath the skit, and it, it was crushed, completely crushed. You know, I could I could see it clearly, and you know, if your bicep was paper thin, that's what it looked like, just completely crushed. You know, you know, the best extrication of the team, you know, teams in the world would have a difficult time getting that arm. And realistically, the best case scenario would have been, uh, you know, Dr. Vale from County going out there and doing a field amputation, like the best case scenario. You know, no, there's no way to get a sky crane out there. So, um, you know, let's just got more pictures here. That's the patient sled right there. That's if we had a patient, thank God, we just refueled. But, um, 
Like I think I think my laptop is in there somewhere. The the NTSB said your laptop was still open. You know there was the paperwork was there. Um, they found our helmets nearby. Uh, that's the door on my side. I had a really really big laceration, um, about gay big. You know down in the muscle of my left calf. So uh, which I really I didn't really feel until later. Uh, so uh, when all this is going on, you know. You know, the sun, sun set fast, you know, and then the temperature dropped fast. You know, oh man, the fuel, we, we were drenched in fuel because we had just refueled, we were just topped off of fuel. So I remember even the fuel was just running out of the aircraft right next to us and it was just, oh my God. You know, so that, that was an issue. Um, you know, um, so by this point, you know, I, I was telling Chad, you know, like, uh, you know, hey man, like, you know, tell me how you're feeling, what are your injuries? It's, I, you know, I can't feel my arm, and I, I feel like, I'm, like I can't catch my breath. I feel like I have a pneumo, which was what they found he had, was a massive pneumo. So, you know, and he was at times four, you know, talking to me, you know, chatting up. Um, any of you who know me, you know, I'm kind of a notoriously positive guy. Um, so I told me, hey man, we're gonna, we're gonna have a good laugh about this one day, you know? Our friends will find us, no time, no problem. Um, I did tell them I was going to write a very strongly worded letter to Air Methods about this, so <laughs> he, we both had a good laugh about that. So, but you know, um, about an hour into it, we, we were both really cold. It was the coldest night of the year, ironically, and I think the temperature up there was um, in the upper 20s, 29, I think it was. So it was, you know, below freezing. You know, I had a I had a thermal shirt on and my flight suit and. You know, all the cold weather gear we did have was crushed in the wreckage and yard sailed over the mountain. So um, the, the coal was just unrelenting. There was no escape from it. Like the pain, you could kind of sit in one position, that position of comfort, but the coal was just inescapable. So um, by this time, you know, you think, you know, air combo, nowhere missing, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, it's 30 minutes without any contact, they start to assume a missing aircraft. Well, the dispatcher who was watching us was brand new. She was overwhelmed and flustered, and she had taken us off the radar. Um, so essentially, we were, we were completely missing, and they forgot about us for about three hours. So, you know, you know what, what can you do, man? So by this time, I was like, you know, like, man, what? The ELT's got to be going off, you know, our location transmitter, you know, they got to start looking for us, you know, but, you know, one hour turned to two, two turned to three, you know, it started, it started with freezing, you know, freezing, you know, like I said, about an hour into it, you know, Chad, I could tell Chad's LSC was starting to change, you know, he's kind of, you know, talking to people who weren't there and delirious, you know, his, you could see his work of breathing, you know, getting bad. Um, you know, and I remember talking to him, and uh, you know, he slipped away. You know, he, he died quietly, and you know, it's hard. You know, I wish I could have done more. That's probably the biggest thing. You just wish you could have done more for your friend. You know, it's things, things I struggle with with that. You know, and then it's just you. You know, just you on a mountain with your dead friends next to you. You know, it's it's hard. You know, if wondering when. When am I going to die? You know, no one's coming right now. So, so, uh, anywho, so at this point, you know, I knew I'd have to figure out something. You know, staying warm, doing what I could to just n not get hurt further. So I, you know, I found like a kind of a position of comfort. Um, I knew that the cold was going to kill me. Like I was, it was killing me. So I, uh, I found a uh, my seat, part of my seat, actually the seat cushion. What was near the wreckage around me. So I took that and took out my shears and I cut the back of the seat off and uh, kind of made the world's most r ridiculous survival beanie, but, but, it, but it worked well. You know, I remember I covered my ears and I could, I could uh, uh, wasn't shivering as bad. And then I'd found one of our vests, like one of our, just our regular, uh, you know, stay warm vests. Um, which was Chad's, it had Chad's nameplate on it, and that complicated things further. So everyone thought I was Chad, basically. So, anyway, um, getting rescued, you know, I knew the only advantage I had was that it was nighttime, 
and that the crews would be under uh, night vision looking for us. And those of you who've been under goggles, like you, you can pick out a light source, you know, miles away. So, you know, but I think this is like hour number four. And I remember hearing rotors in the area. Um, and so I was like, all right. And then I saw a ship on what was about our flight path. You know, so I was like, all right, all right. You know, so I took out my cell phone, which I forgot and came back and get it, and uh, turned on the flashlight. You know, I remember being so nervous that they were going to fly by that I was shouting out, like actually shouting out the code to my phone so I wouldn't like slow myself down. So when it turned it on, all I did was just flash it at them. Like I could lean out of the wreckage through this area right here. And, uh, you know, sure enough, um, if you're ever in that situation, I promise you, you will talk to the aircraft that are trying to, like, some of them are like, look right, look right, look right. And sure enough, they, they changed, like they banked, dropped altitude, and then the pilot turned on their spotlight. You know, this was just kind of a Hail Mary for me. I didn't think it would actually work. Um, but it, sure enough, they came down and the pilot um, did this awesome swoop, just swooped right over us and came back. And then they started to orbit, um, you know, and going from, you know, being alone out there to, like, actually having confirmation that they know you're missing and you're crashed, you know, help us on the way. Like, it was a, a big mental boost. Um, people have asked me, you know, did you ever just think about laying down and going to sleep? It's like, like, I thought about it, you know. I was like, man, I'll just maybe just close my eyes, you know. But we've all seen that movie. That's where people die. I was like, no one. <laughs> so, so I, I was just, I told him, I, was, I remember telling myself, this is going to be the longest night of my life, and I'm going to just keep breathing until I stop. So I was like, just make it till morning. You know, like, I can make it till morning. So, um, but they, they saw my light. And this is where things really started moving. Once, once they, they confirmed a crash, um, things started moving fast. So that's when DPS came over. And that was Angela. Angela Rose, who was the medic who jumped out. And then Mario, Mario, Captain Mario over here. Could you stand up? Come on. Come on. <laughs> so he and um, Brooke are my, uh, my angels. So I, uh, I always like to recognize them. It should be you guys up here, not me. So, you know, all I do is sit there. So. <laughs> But so Angela, their pilot was able to maneuver to the, the rock, the outcropping of rock right there where the snow is on the bottom. And Angela uh, jumped out. You know, they could have easily crashed, easily been hurt, you know. So she jumped out and was able to get to me. Unfortunately, she dropped her, her medic bag and it rolled down the mountain. So, so welcome, to the, welcome to the party, Angela. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lot of that lately. <laughs> So, but, um, like, I remember, um, first of all, their rotor wash was blowing all this snow at me. I was like, oh, my God, this is so cold. So, but um, having an, a human being in front of you that's there to rescue you is just an indescribable, you know, feeling. You know, having someone there, and you're not alone, sitting in the dark, you know. You know, it was really, it's powerful. It's really powerful. So. so now it's Angela and me, and she starts moving pieces fast. Um, um, Native 17 was staged in the area. Like, they were, they were orbiting um, nearby, but they, they got fuel critical, um, and they had to go back to base. So Aravac 7, which was Mario and Brooke, you know, they were, I know you guys were talking it up. Aravac 4, excuse me, Aravac 4, not Aravac 7. So, so um, they they were in the area orbiting too, um, and they their pilot sat down in the area um, about a mile and a half away, mile and a half away, right? Yeah, you know this is pitch black, you know six foot high brush, you know, and Mario and Brooke hiked a mile and a half at night, snow covered terrain, you know, to get to me, you know that's bravery. You know, beyond words, you know. You know. You know, I just and then I remember 
hearing you guys, we were shouting out, and then all of a sudden, you know, Brooke and Mario, you know, are, you know, at the party now, and um, I don't envy what they went through. You know, they had to step over, step over Chad's body, the fuel, like they were covered in fuel too now. You know, I, I think about that with you guys, and I, you know, I just don't want you to know that I don't think about that, and so, you know, what they went through too. Um, so at this point, um, they, you got, I remember you guys assessing me and, uh, you know, trying to, trying to, uh, you know, get my vitals and all that. And I remember Mario, um, he um, gave me an uh, IM shot in the arm, which I thought was fentanyl, which I was fine, but it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it turned out it was ketamine. <laughs> and uh, if any of you have any doubts about ketamine, Mm -mm -mm. It, it was good. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> so I actually, I, I, uh, I went unresponsive. I got knocked out. The, to, to be very honest with you, Theo, I thought, I thought I had died, and this was what ever comes next. Um, Mario says I stopped breathing. So, yeah, I thought you did. He, he, he gave me some resuscitative slaps on the face. <laughs> I didn't see that in the ACLS program. <laughs> it did work. I remember. I remember. I remember just like, you know, talking gibberish. But, but I was. I was out. Man, oh man, I was out. So, um, so while all this is going on, and I remember when Angela got to me, she said, "I don't think we're gonna be able to get you out till morning because they could long line, but they didn't have a winch, and they don't, you, you can't long line tonight. It's just too dangerous." So I remember telling her, 